Καλό. Ναι. Μπράβο. Καλό. Ένα, δύο. Theathen. Born by luminous pillars, the palace of the sun god rose lustrous with gold and flame red rubies. The cornice was of dazzling ivory, and carved in relief on the wide silver doors were legends and miracle tales. To this beautiful place came Phaeton, son of Phoebus, and asked for his father, the sun god. He dared not approach too closely, but stopped at a little distance, because he could not endure that glittering, burning nearness. Phoebus, robed in crimson, was seated on his throne adorned with matchless emeralds. To the right and the left of him stood his retinue ranged in appointed order, the day, the month, the year, the centuries, and the seasons, young spring with his fillet of flowers, summer garlanded with sheaves of yellow grain, wine-stained autumn, and winter, whose locks were white as hail. The all-seeing eyes of Phoebus, in the midst of these, soon noticed the youth, who was gazing at the glory about him in silent amazement. Why did you undertake this journey? he asked him. What brings you to the palace of your father, my son? O oh, father, answered Phaeton, it is because on earth men are making mock of me and slandering my mother climbing. They say that I only pretend to be of heavenly origin, and that, in reality, I am the son of a quite ordinary, unknown man. So I have come to beg of you some token which will prove to the world that I am indeed your son. He paused, and Phoebus laid aside the beams which circled his head and bade him come close. Then he embraced him tenderly, flinging his arms around him, and said, Climene, your mother, told you the truth, my son, and I shall never disown you in the face of the world. But to dispel your doubts forever, ask a gift of me. I swear by the sticks, that river in the underworld upon which all gods take their oath, that your wish shall be granted, no matter what it may be. Phaeton barely waited for his father to finish. Then make my wildest dream come true, he cried. For one whole day let me guide the winged chariot of the sun. Fear and sorrow shadowed the god's shining face. Three, for times he shook his radiant head. At last he said, O oh son, you beguiled me into speaking rash words. If only I could retract my promise. For you have asked something which is beyond your strength. You are young, you are mortal, but what you crave is granted only to the gods, and not to all of them, for only I am permitted to do what you are so eager to try. Only I can stand on the glowing axle which showers sparks as it moves through the air. My chariot must travel a steep path. It is a difficult climb for the horses even when they are fresh, at dawn. The middle of the course lies at the zenith of the sky. I tell you that I myself am often shaken with dread when, at such a height, I stand upright in my chariot. My head spins when I look down on the lands and seas so far beneath me and the last stretch of the way descends sharply and requires a sure hand on the reins. Even Thetis, goddess of the sea, who waits to receive me in her smooth waters, is full of alarm lest I be hurled from the sky. And there is still another peril to consider, for you must remember that heaven turns incessantly and that the driving is against the sweep of its vast rotations. Even if I gave you my chariot, how could you overcome such obstacles? No, dear son, do not insist that I keep my word to you, but mend your wish while there is still time. You can read my concern from my face. Could you but look through my eyes into my heart, heavy with a father's anxiety? Choose anything that earth and heaven have to offer, and by the sticks I swear it shall be yours, you fling your arms around me? Alas, that it is to ask this dangerous thing. The youth pleaded and pleaded, and Phoebus Apollo had, after all, sworn a most sacred oath. So he took his son by the hand and led him to the sun chariot, the work of Hephaestus. Pole, axle, and the rims of the wheels were of gold, the spokes of silver, and the yoke glittered with chrysolite and other precious stones. 
While Phaeton was still marveling at this perfect craftsmanship, Dawn wakened in the east and flung wide the doors to her rosy chamber. The stars faded, last of all the morning star, which lingers longest at his post in the heavens, and the horns of the crescent moon paled on the brightening horizon. Now Phoebus ordered the winged hours to yoke the horses, and they did as he bade, bringing the shining flanked animals, sated with ambrosia, out of their splendid stalls, and putting them into the gleaming harness. Then the father salved the face of his son with a magic ointment to enable him to withstand the heat of the flames. He crowned his head with sun rays, sighing all the while, and said warningly, Child, spare the goad and use the reins, for the horses will run of themselves, and your labor will lie in slowing their flight. The course slants in a wide and shallow curve. Keep away from both the south and the north poles. You will find the road by the tracks the wheels have left. Do not drive too slow, lest the earth catch fire, nor too high, lest you burn up the sky. So go now, if you must. Darkness is passing. Take the reins in your hands, or, dear son, there is still time to give up this folly. Leave the chariot to me, and let me shed the light on the world. Be content to watch. The boy scarcely heard what his father said. One spring, and he was up in the chariot, exultant at having the reins in his own hands. He only nodded and smiled his thanks to unhappy Phoebus. The four winged horses neighed, and the air kindled with their burning breath. In the meantime, Thetis, knowing nothing of her grandchild's venture, opened wide her portals, the vast spaces of the world lay before Phaeton's eyes, and the horses bounded up the course and broke through the mists of morning. But soon they felt that their burden was lighter than usual, and like ships which toss on the ocean when the hold is not heavy with cargo, the chariot reeled and floundered through the air and swerved aimlessly, as though it were empty. When the horses became aware of this, they wheeled from the beaten paths of the sky and jostled each other in savage haste. Phaeton began to tremble. He did not know which way to pull the reins, he did not know where he was, nor could he curb the animals straining from him with headlong speed. When he looked down from the arch of the heavens and saw the land spread out so far below, his cheeks grew pale and his knees shook with terror. He glanced back over his shoulder, and much of the sky lay in his wake, he turned forward and more loomed ahead. In his mind he measured the vast reaches before and behind, and not knowing what to do he stared into space. His helpless hands neither slackened nor tightened the reins. He wanted to call to the horses, but did not know their names. He saw the many constellations strewing the heavens, and his heart numbed with horror at their strange shapes, like those of monsters. Chill with despair he dropped the reins, and instantly the horses shied from their course, leaping sidewise into unfamiliar regions of air. Now they sprang forward, now they plunged down. Now they rushed against the fixed stars, and now they slanted toward earth. They grazed against drifts of cloud, which kindled and began to smolder. Lower and lower hurtled the chariot until the wheels touched the tall mountains. The earth panted and cracked with heat, the saps were dried out of growing things, and suddenly everything began to flicker. The heather yellowed and drooped. The leaves of the forest trees shriveled and burst into flame. The fire sped onto the plains and scorched the harvests. Entire cities went up in smoke, and whole countries with all their peoples burned to cinders. Hills were consumed, and woods, and mountains. They say that it was then the skin of the Ethiopians turned black. Rivers ran dry or streamed backwards to regain their sources. The sea itself shrank and narrowed so that what its waters had only lately covered was now nothing but dry sand. The world was afire, and Phaeton began to suffer from the intolerable heat. Every breath he drew seemed to come from a seething furnace, and the chariot seared the soles of his feet. He was tortured with fumes and blasts of ashes cast up by the burning earth. Smoke black as pitch surged around him, while the horses jounced and tossed him hither and thither. And then his hair caught fire. He fell from the chariot and whirled through space like a shooting star, such as sometimes trails its brightness through the clear sky. 
Far from his home, the broad river Eridanus received him and closed over his throbbing limbs. His father, the sun god, who had witnessed the sight of destruction, veiled his radiant head and brooded in sorrow. It is said that this day brought no light to the world. Only the great conflagration shone far and wide. Europa I am the land of Tyre and Sidon, Europa, daughter of King Aegenor, was reared in the seclusion of her father's palace. Once, at midnight, when mortals are visited by fanciful dreams which have a clear core of truth, heaven sent her a curious vision. It seemed to her that two continents, Asia and that which lies opposite, in the guise of women, were fighting to possess her. One of the women had a foreign air. The other, and this was Asia, looked and acted like one of Europa's own countrywomen, and claimed her warmly and vehemently, saying that it was she who had born and nurtured this lovely child. But the strange woman clasped her in her strong arms like a stolen treasure and drew her away with her. The oddest part of the dream was that Europa did not resist her with any real force or purpose. Come with me, little love, said the stranger. I shall bring you to Zeus, the Aegis bearer, for destiny has appointed you his beloved. Europa awoke. The blood pulsed madly in her temples, and she started up from her couch, for the vision of night had been as bright and distinct as the reality of day. For a long time she sat upright and motionless, staring into space with wide open eyes, and still seeing the two women before her. At last her lips moved, and she asked herself in alarm, What God has sent me this vision? What curious dream has beguiled me while I slept, safe in the house of my father? Who was the strange woman? What new yearning quickened my heart at sight of her? How lovingly she approached me, and even when she snatched me away she looked at me with a mother's tender gaze. May the gods let my dream be for the best. Morning had come, and the fair light of day dispelled the darkness of her visions from Europa's spirit. She rose to busy herself with her usual girlish tasks and pleasures. Friends and companions of her own age gathered about her, the daughters of noble houses, who attended her on her walks, at choral dances, and the rites of offering. They came to conduct their young mistress to a meadow strewn with many flowers, close by the sea where the girls of that region assembled to delight in the mass of blooms and the sound of the surf lapping the shore. All the girls carried baskets, and Europa herself had one of gold, carved with shining scenes from the lives of the gods. It was the work of Hephaestus, and Poseidon, the earth shaker, had given it to Libya in those long ago days when he was courting her. It had passed from hand to hand until Aegenor received it as an heirloom. Swinging this basket, which was more like a bride's finery than an article for everyday use, lovely Europa ran before her playmates onto the shoreland meadows bright with color. The girls scattered with merry words and gay laughter, each to pluck those flowers that pleased her fancy. One broke the glistening narcissus, another the fragrant hyacinth, a third chose the fainter scented violet. Some preferred the spicy thyme, others the yellow crocus. So they ran here and there over the meadow, but Europa soon found what she was seeking. Taller than they, like the foam-born goddess of love among the graces, she stood among her friends and held high in her hands a great bunch of glowing roses. When they had gathered all they wanted, the girls flung themselves down in the soft grass and began to plait wreaths, which later they would hang on green boughs as thank offerings to the nymphs of that place. But their pleasure in their dainty work was doomed to be short-lived, for, of a sudden, fate broken upon Europa's carefree maidenhood, the fate the dream of the past night had shadowed forth. Zeus, son of Cronus, struck by the arrow of Aphrodite, who alone among the immortals could overcome the unconquerable father of the gods, was stirred by the beauty of young Europa. But because he feared the anger of jealous Hera and could hardly hope to tempt the girl's innocent spirit if he came in his own form, the god contrived a ruse. He assumed the shape of a bull. But no ordinary bull. Not like one that paces the common field, bends to the yoke, and draws the loaded wagon. He was great and splendid, with swelling neck and massive shoulders. His horns were slight and graceful as though a hand had wrought them, and more transparent than flawless jewels. 
Yellow gold in color was his body, but in the very middle of his forehead shimmered a silvery mark shaped like the crescent moon. Rolling restlessly in their sockets, his blue-black eyes smoldered with desire. Before transforming himself, Zeus had summoned Hermes to Olympus and, without a word about his purpose, had directed him to do him a certain service. Hasten, dear son, loyal executor of my commands, he said. Do you see that land below us, to the left? It is Phoenicia. Go there and drive the herds of King Aegenor, which you will find grazing on the mountain slopes, down to the shore of the sea. Instantly the winged god, obedient to his father's words, flew to the Sidonian pastures and drove the king's cattle, among which Zeus, unbeknown to Hermes, had mingled himself in his new shape, down to those very meadows in which Aegenor's daughter, surrounded by her Tyrian maidens, was light-heartedly toying with garlands. The herd dispersed and began cropping the grass at a distance from the girls. Only the beautiful bull that housed a god approached the green mound on which Europa and her playmates were seated. He moved with perfect grace. His forehead did not threaten, and his flashing eyes begot no fears. He seemed gentleness itself. Europa and her maidens admired the noble proportions of the animal and his peaceful manner. They wanted to see him more closely and stroke his shimmering back. The bull seemed to be aware of this, for he drew nearer and nearer and finally came to a stand right in front of Europa. At first she was startled and shrank back, but the bull did not move. He appeared to be quite tame, so she took courage, went up to him, and held the roses to his foam-flecked lips, which breathed out the scent of ambrosia. Caressingly he licked the proffered flowers and the delicate hand which wiped the foam from his mouth and began to stroke him with tenderness and love. More and ever more enchanting did the glorious creature seem to the girl. She even ventured to kiss his silken forehead. At that he bellowed joyfully, but it was not the bellow of a common bull, but like the sound of a Lydian flute echoing through a gorge between high mountains. Then he crouched at her feet, looked at her full of longing, and turned his head as if to point his broad back to her. And now Europa called to her maidens. Come closer, she cried. Let us climb on the back of this beautiful bull and ride him. I think there is room for four of us at a time. See how tame he is, how gentle. Not in the least like other bulls. I do believe he has the power of reason, just like human beings, and all that he lacks is speech. While she was speaking, she took the wreaths from the hands of her playmates and hung them one after another on the lowered horns of the bull. Then she sprang lightly to his back, while the other girls hung back, hesitating and afraid. When the bull had thus got what he wanted, he bounded up from the ground. First he walked slowly, yet so that Europa's companions could not quite keep pace with him. But when the meadow lay behind and the empty strand stretched ahead, he doubled his speed and seemed a flying steed rather than a trotting bull. Before the girl knew what was happening, he had leaped into the sea and was swimming away with his quarry. With her right hand she clung to one of his horns, with her left she steadied herself on his back. The wind billowed out her gown as though it were a sail. In terror she looked back at the receding shore and called to her comrades, but in vain. The waters lapped against the sides of the bull, and shying from the wet she drew up her little heels. The bull floated on like a ship. Soon the land vanished from sight, the sun set, and in the vague shimmer of night, the girl saw nothing but waves and stars. All the next day the bull swam through vast reaches of sea, but he parted the water so adroitly that not a drop touched his rider. At last, toward evening, they reached a far-off land. The bull swung himself ashore and let the girl slip from his back under the arching boughs of a tree. Then he vanished, and in his place stood a man, beautiful as the gods, who told her he was the ruler of the island to which she had come, the island of Crete, and that he would protect her if she consented to be his. In her sadness and desolation, Europa gave him her hand in token of agreement. Zeus had accomplished his desire. Europa woke from the numbness of long sleep when the sun stood high in the heavens. She was alone and looked about her, helpless and bewildered, as though she expected to find herself at home. 
Father, father, she cried in distress. Then she remembered and said, How dare I even utter the word father, I who have had no care for my maidenhood. What madness made me forget a child's love and devotion? Again she looked around, and slowly everything came back to her. From where, and to what place have I come, she said. Death would be a penalty too light for my failing. But am I really awake? Am I mourning an actual disgrace? Perhaps only a misty dream, which will dissolve when I close my lids again, is troubling my spirit. It is impossible to think that I chose to climb on a monster's back, that I swam the seas, rather than pluck fresh blooms in sweet security. Even as she spoke, she passed her palm across her eyes as if to banish a nightmare. But when she opened them, she saw the same alien scene, unfamiliar trees and rocks, and the white churn of the tide, dashing against looming cliffs and rushing on to a shore she had never seen. Oh, if someone would only deliver that bull up to me now, she cried in anger. I should rend his flesh and break his horns. Idle wish. I have left my home thoughtlessly and without shame, so what is there for me but to die? If all the gods have forsaken me, let them at least send a lion or a tiger. Perhaps my beauty will tempt their appetites, and I need not wait for hunger to fade the bloom on my cheeks. But no savage beast appeared. Smiling and tranquil, the unfamiliar landscape spread before her, and the sun shone from a cloudless sky. As though pursued by the furies, the girl sprang to her feet. Miserable Europa, she cried, do you not hear your father's voice? He is far away but still he will curse you unless you put an end to your shameful life. Do you not see him pointing to that ash tree on which you can hang yourself by your girdle or that steep cliff from which you can plunge to an unquiet grave in the stormy sea? Or do you prefer to be the concubine of a barbarian lord and slave for him day after day, spinning your wool, you, the daughter of a great and powerful king? In this way she tormented herself with the thought of death without finding the courage to die. Suddenly, she heard a low mocking whisper, and fearing an eavesdropper, looked over her shoulder in alarm. There, bright with unearthly radiance, stood Aphrodite, and beside her Eros, her son, with lowered bow. A smile lingered on the lips of the goddess. Calm your anger and rebel no longer, she said. The bull you loathe will come and hold out his horns so that you may break them. It is I who sent you the dream you had in your father's house. Be comforted, Europa. You were carried off by a god. You are destined to be the mortal wife of Zeus, the unconquerable. And your name shall be immortal, for from this time on the continent which received you shall be called Europe. Cadmus. Cadmus was Europa's brother, a son of Aegenor, king of Phoenicia. When Zeus, in the shape of a bull, had carried off Europa, Aegenor sent Cadmus and his brothers in search of her, telling them not to come back until they had accomplished their quest. For a long time Cadmus wandered through the world in vain, unable to find her whom the wiles of Zeus had spirited away. He feared his father's anger at his failure, and so, not wishing to return to his own country, he consulted the oracle of Phoebus Apollo and asked what land he should dwell in the rest of his life. And the sun god replied, In a lonely meadow you will find a heifer who has never borne the yoke. Follow her, and where she lies down to rest in the grass, in that place you shall build a city and call it Thebes. Scarcely had Cadmus left the Castalian fountain, the site of Apollo's oracle, when he came to a green pasture, and in it grazed a heifer whose neck bore no marks of the yoke. With a silent prayer to Phoebus, he slowly followed in the creature's tracks. She waded the ford of Cephasus and had just crossed a wide tract of land when she stopped, pointed her horns at the sky, and filled the air with her lowing. Then she glanced back at Cadmus and his retinue and finally lay down in the thick-growing tender grass. Full of gratitude, Cadmus prostrated himself and kissed the alien earth. Then he prepared to offer sacrifice to Zeus and sent his servants in search of a living spring to provide water for the libation. In that place, there was an age-old wood which had never been thinned by the axe. 
and the very heart of it rocks, joined with a network of bush and underbrush, formed a low vault over a gorge running with clear water. Hidden in this cavern was a wicked dragon. His scarlet crest shone from afar, his eyes flashed flame, his body was swollen with venom, and three tongues flickered from his mouth, which was armed with a triple row of teeth. The Phoenicians had only just entered the grove and let their pitcher down into the water, when the dragon darted his azure head out of the cavern and uttered a fearful hiss. The urn slipped from their hands, and the blood froze in their veins. The dragon, meanwhile, had coiled himself into scaly folds, drew back for the thrust, and, reared to half his height, looked down upon the wood. Then he lunged forward at the Phoenicians, killed some with his fangs, strangled others in his coils, and destroyed the rest by his poisonous spittle or the mere fetid breath from his mouth. Cadmus could not imagine what was keeping his servants. At last he went in search of them. His tunic was a pelt he had torn from a lion, his weapons were a lance and javelin, and, stronger and better than these, his brave heart. Upon entering the grove he saw a mass of bodies, his lifeless servants, and triumphing above them the enemy, his body distended, his tongue lapping the blood of his victims. My poor friends, cried Cadmus, I shall either avenge you or share your death. And he picked up a boulder and hurled it at the dragon. The block was so huge that walls and towers would have shaken at its impact, but the dragon remained unmoved. His thick black hide and stiff scales protected him like a coat of mail. Now Cadmus threw his javelin, and with this he fared better, for the iron point bit deep into the entrails of the monster. Raging with pain, he turned his head and crushed the shaft of the javelin, but the top stuck fast in his body. A sword stroke goaded him to fury, his throat swelled out, and white foam gushed from his poisonous jaws. Straight as an arrow the monster rushed forth, and his breast struck against the trunks of the trees. Eginor's son dodged the onslaught, drew his lion's skin close about him, and let the dragon's teeth spend their force on the point of his lance. At last the blood began to stream from the throat of the beast and stained the green grass around him. But the wound was light, and the dragon evaded every further thrust. Finally, Cadmus buried his sword in his neck. It came out on the other side and pierced an oak tree so that the dragon was nailed to its trunk. The tree was bowed by the weight and meaned as it felt the tip of the monster's tail lashing its bark. For a long time Cadmus gazed at the slain dragon. When he took his eyes from it and looked around, he saw Pallas Athene, who had descended from heaven and now commanded him to turn up the earth and sow the dragon's teeth, the seed for a future race. He obeyed the goddess, plowed a broad and long furrow, and scattered the dragon's teeth in the groove. Of a sudden there was a stir in the clods, and out came, first the point of a lance, then a helmet with a crest of variegated plumes, then shoulders, breast, limbs, and finally a warrior, fully armed, sprang from the earth. This happened in many places at once, so that a whole crop of armed men grew up before the very eyes of the Phoenician. He was greatly alarmed and prepared to fight a fresh foe. But one of the earthborn men called out to him, Do not lift your hand against us. Do not interfere in this war between brothers. Even as he spoke he raised his sword against one of the other warriors and was, at the same instant, struck by a flying javelin. Its thrower, in turn, was wounded and gave up the breath of life he had only just received. And now the entire host fought one another in bitter battle, and soon almost all lay on the ground, writhing in the throes of death, while Mother Earth drank the blood of the sons she had borne for so brief a span. Only five were left. One of these, who later was called Echion, was the first to throw down his arms at Athene's bidding and offer peace. The others followed his example. With these five earthborn warriors, Cadmus, the stranger from Phoenicia, built the city as Apollo had bidden, and, in accordance with the god's command, he called it Thebes. Pentheus. I am Thebes, Bacchus or Dionysus, grandson of Cadmus, the son of Zeus and Simile, was born in a miraculous manner. This god of fruitfulness, the discoverer of the grape, was reared in India, 
but soon left the nymphs who had sheltered and cherished him and voyaged from land to land to spread his new teachings, to instruct people how to grow the vine which gladdens the heart, and bid them found shrines in his honor. Great was the measure of kindness he lavished upon his friends, and just as great the harshness he dealt those who refused to recognize his divinity. His fame had already reached Greece and penetrated to the city of his birth. Thebes at that time was ruled by Pentheus, to whom Cadmus had given his kingdom. Pentheus was the son of earthborn Echion and Agave, the sister of the wine god's mother. This king of Thebes scorned the gods and most of all his kinsman Dionysus. And so when he approached with his retinue of exultant Bacantes to reveal himself as a god, Pentheus ignored the warning of Tiresias, the blind and aged seer. And when he heard that Theban men and women and girls were flocking to adore the new god, he began to rage against them. What madness has come upon you? he asked. You Thebans, who are descended from the dragon, you who have never retreated from the trumpet that summons to battle, or from the death-bringing sword, will you now surrender to a mob of soft-handed fools and women? And you people of Phoenicia, who came from beyond the sea and founded a city in honor of your old gods, have you forgotten the race of heroes who begot you? Will you suffer an unarmed boy to conquer Thebes, a weakling whose locks drip with myrrh, who wreathes his tender brow with vine leaves, who goes robed in purple and gold rather than in mail, who cannot master a horse, and is indifferent to wars and feuds? If only you will come to your senses, I shall soon force him to own he is mortal just like myself, who am his cousin, that Zeus is not his father, and that all these rites and mummeries are the invention of a pretender. And he turned to his servants and commanded them to seize the author of this new madness, wherever they might come upon him, and bring him to the city in chains. The friends and kinsmen of Pentheus were aghast at his insolent words. His grandfather Cadmus, who was still alive though very old, shook his white head in disapproval. But counsel and dissent only served to swell the king's rage, which leaped over all the stumbling stones set in his path as an angry river breaks through a dam. In the meantime, his servants returned, and their faces were stained with blood. Where is Dionysus? Pentheus shouted to them. We could not find him anywhere, they replied. But we have brought you one of his followers. He has not been with him very long, it seems. Pentheus studied his captive with furious eyes and cried, You are doomed. You must die on the instant, as a warning example to the rest. What is your name? Who are your parents? Where did you come from? And tell me also why you perform these silly, newfangled rites. The prisoner answered, and his voice was calm and without fear. My name is Akoites, Mionia is my country, and my parents are of the common people. Neither fields nor flocks did my father leave me. All he taught me was how to fish with the rod, for this skill was the sole treasure he possessed. Soon I also learned how to manage a ship and to recognize the stars and the constellations, to know the winds and what harbors are good. I became a seaman. Once, on a voyage to Delos, I came to an unknown coast where we cast anchor. I jumped from the ship, landed on the wet sand, and spent the night ashore without my comrades. The next morning I rose at early dawn and climbed a hill to find out what the winds held in store. In the meantime, my comrades had also left the ship and, on my way back, I met them dragging with them a youth they had seized on the empty strand. The boy had a girlish beauty. He was dazed with wine and drowsy, and walked with faltering steps. When I looked at him more closely, it seemed to me that his face, and the way he moved and bore himself, betrayed one more than mortal. I do not know what god it is who is hidden within this youth. I called to the crew, but I am wholly certain that it is a god. Then I turned to the boy. Whoever you may be, I said, I implore you to give us your favor and speed our work. Forgive these who carried you off. What foolishness is this? cried one of the men. Leave off praying to him. And the others laughed. Blinded by their greed for profit, they took hold of the boy and started dragging him onto the ship. It was in vain that I resisted. 
the youngest and sturdiest in the mob, a fugitive from a Tyrrhenian city where he had committed murder, took me by the throat and cast me overboard. Had I not caught my foot in the rigging, I would surely have drowned. All this time the boy lay on deck as though in a deep sleep. Suddenly, wakened perhaps by the noise, he started up, sobered, and went up to the sailors. What is all this? he cried. Tell me what destiny has brought me here and where you are taking me. Do not be afraid, boy, said one of the men, falsely reassuring him. Just tell us the port you wish to go to, and we will set you ashore wherever you say. Then steer your course to the island of Naxos, the youth replied, for that is my home. They swore by all the gods to do as he bade them, and told me to set the sails. Naxus lay to our right, but when I shortened the sails accordingly, they signed to me and whispered, What are you up to, you fool? Are you mad? Go left. I was amazed and incredulous. Let another take over and steer the ship, I said, and stepped aside. As if our welfare on this voyage depended upon you, a coarse fellow called to me derisively and proceeded to set the sails in my stead. And he turned the ship away from Naxus and steered an opposite course. The young god stood at the stern and gazed out upon the sea. His lips curved to a scornful smile as though he had only just discovered the sailor's crude deceit. At last he spoke, pretending to weep. Alas! These are not the promised shores. This is not the land I asked to go to. Do you think that grown men ought to trick a child? But the impious crew made mock of his tears and mine and plied their oars with swift and lusty strokes. But suddenly the ship stood still in the ocean, as motionless as if it were beached. In vain did they strike the waves with their poles, spread all the sails, and strive on with redoubled effort. The oars were twined with ivy, and vines clung about the mast with delicate tendrils, and, growing upward in wide curve, hung the sails with rich clusters of fruit. Dionysus himself, for it was he, stood upright in divine splendor. A fillet of leaves bound his forehead, and in his hand was the thyrsus garlanded with vine. Around him, in unsubstantial vision, tigers, lynxes, and panthers crouched on the deck, and a stream of scented wine flowed through the ship. The crew recoiled from him in terror and madness. One was about to scream, but found his lips and nose grown to a fish's mouth, and before the rest could give voice to their horror at the sight, the same thing happened to them. Their bodies dwindled, and the skin hardened to bluish scales. Their spines arched, their arms shrank to fins, their feet fused to a tail. All had turned into fish, leaped into the sea, and bobbed up and down with the waves. Of twenty men I was the only one left, and I trembled in every limb, thinking that on the very next instant I too should lose my human shape. But Dionysus spoke to me kindly, for I had done him no harm. Do not be alarmed, he said. Take me to Naxus. And when we reached the island, he initiated me into the mysteries of his service at his holy altar. We have been listening to your chatter far too long, cried King Pentheus. Seize him, he commanded his men. Rend him with a thousand tortures and dispatch him to the underworld. His henchmen obeyed. They shackled the seaman and cast him into a deep dungeon, but an invisible hand set him free. This incident marked the beginning of the persecution visited upon the followers of Dionysus. Agave, mother of Pentheus, and her sisters had taken part in the wild rites of the god. The king sent for them and had all the Bacantes thrown into the city prison. But they too slipped from their bonds without mortal aid. The gates of their jail flew open, and they rushed out into the woods, their veins hot with backsheek frenzy. As for the servant who had been sent to capture the god himself with the aid of an armed force, he returned in utter bewilderment, for Dionysus had held out his hands for the shackles with a smile. And now he stood bound before the king, who could not help wondering at his radiant young beauty. Yet Pentheus obstinately held to his error and persisted in treating him as a vagabond, an adventurer who feigned to be a god. He had the captive weighed with chains and thrust into a dark cell at the back of the palace, where the horses had their mangers. 
But at a word from the god the earth shook, the walls crumbled, and his bonds dissolved. Unharmed and in even greater loveliness he appeared among his worshippers. Messenger after messenger came to King Pentheus and brought him tidings of the miracles the bands of frenzied women, led by his mother and sisters, were working in the wood. They had only to strike the rock with their wands, and clear water or fragrant wine bubbled and gushed from the barren stone. Beneath the touch of the thyrsus, streams turned to milk, and hollow trees dripped with pale honey. And had you, yourself, been there, O king, said one of the messengers, and seen the god against whom you rail, you would have thrown yourself on the earth at his feet, and your lips would have uttered prayers. All this only served to make the hatred of Pentheus more bitter. He ordered his riders and armed troops, heavy and light, to pursue the host of women. At this Dionysus returned of his own accord and came before the king as his own emissary. He promised Pentheus to bring back the Menads if the king would don woman's raiment, lest seeing him, a man, and uninitiate, they tear him to pieces. Reluctantly and full of suspicion, Pentheus accepted this proposal. In the end, he followed the god out of the city, already stricken with the madness Dionysus had sent upon him. He seemed to see two sons, a twofold Thebes, and each of the city gates doubled. Dionysus looked like a bull to him, a beast with great horns on his head. Against his will he fell under the backsheek spell. He begged for a thyrsus and, when it was given him, stormed away in frenzy and exultation. In this fashion they came to a deep valley, rich in springs and shaded with pines, where the priestesses of Bacchus were assembled, some singing hymns to their god, others twining their staffs with fresh ivy. But either Pentheus was stricken with blindness, or his guide had succeeded in leading him by such roundabout ways that he did not observe the throngs of women. And now the god lifted his hand and, a marvel having come to pass, it reached to the top of a tall pine, which he curved as one twists a willow wife. Then he perched Pentheus in the topmost boughs and gradually, and with due care, allowed the tree to return to its upright position. Oddly enough, the king did not fall and suddenly appeared in full sight, high up in the pine where the Bacchantes could see him without being seen themselves. And now Dionysus called down into the valley, and his voice rang loud and clear, Behold him who made mock of our holiest rites. Behold and punish him. The air was still. No leaf quivered on its stem, no creature made a sound. The Menads lifted their heads. Their eyes were glazed with wild light as they listened to the voice which came a second time. When they knew it for their masters, they sped swifter than doves. In divine madness they forded the rivers which had overflowed their banks, and thorny thickets parted to let them pass. At last they were close enough to recognize their king and persecutor clinging to the topmost boughs of the pine. First they hurled stones, boughs torn from trees, and their wands, but they could not reach the height where he hung precariously among the green needles. Then they took the hardwood of oak and dug around the pine until the roots were laid bare, and Pentheus, groaning aloud, fell with the falling trunk. His mother Agave, on whose lids the god had laid a spell so that she did not recognize her son, signed for the slaughter to begin. Terror had restored the king to his senses. Not you, mother. Let it not be you who punishes the sins of her own child, he cried, throwing his arms about her neck. Do you not know your own son, your son Pentheus, whom you bore in Echion's house? But the frantic priestess of Bacchus foamed at the mouth and stared at him with wide open eyes. And what she saw was not her son, but a mountain lion, and gripping his right shoulder she tore out his arm. Her sisters rested out his left, and then the whole raging band closed upon him, each seizing some part of his body until he was wrenched limb from limb. Agave herself clutched his head in her bloodstained hands, fastened it upon her thyrsus, still believing it to be the head of a lion, and carried it triumphantly through the woods of Scythian. Thus did the god Dionysus take revenge on one who had scoffed at his sacred rites.